All right, are you ready for it? This is the Pencil Kings podcast. And just before we start, I want to give us a slight plug to our own website, PencilKings.com, where you can go and get affordable art training. We've got lots of drawing tutorials, lots of Photoshop tutorials. So if you're listening to this and you've been wanting to get started with art, um, head over and, and check us out and see what we're all about. Now, today we're talking to Matt McCosker. And Matt's you're a veteran. I looked at your resume and it goes back. It goes way back. So, Matt, why don't you introduce yourself? What do you do uh, right now? I'm Matt McCosker, and at the moment, I'm often visual effects supervising on various uh, television commercials, um, and I'm part of a, uh, a collective of creative minds here in Sydney, and I'm keeping myself busy with uh, with that and and life drawing and uh, and two very young boys. <laughs> Let's start. Can you tell us how you got started or where did you start? Uh, we'll get into exactly what a visual effects supervisor does because I think it's a really interesting role. But where did that journey begin? For me, that journey began with uh, my year three science project. My mother was an art teacher, so I had the benefit of... of, um, of of a sort of art training from the age of, you know, well, I did life drawing at the age of six, which was interesting. Um, and, uh, sort of being taken along to life drawing classes, that sort of thing. Um, and my year three science project was a, a stop motion animation about the, uh, the eye. And we used a uh, plasticine with wire as like an armature through the body. And uh, we had this sort of eyeball, which would run around the stage and, illustrate the various parts of the eye etc it was fraught with uh, difficulties we're, sh we're shooting on super 8 and uh, we had these two 500 watt lights sort of bearing down on the plasticine so basically the character kept melting <laughs> <laughs> and we had like a stunt double in the fridge and we'd sort of like swap them out in the animation like they, they kind of sort of slowly melt and then perk up and then slowly melt and then perk up and uh, it was all straight animation so you start at the beginning and you just go editing in camera all that kind of thing that really got me enthused and we screened that in front of the rest of the school <laughs> <laughs> wow, I bet they were blown away when they saw that. Yeah, so are we. I think we only watched it like once before. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. At that point in your life, I'm sure you weren't a professional animator. I'm sure you had to figure out a lot of things along the way, but you just dove headfirst and you did it. And you, you probably didn't think of a whole lot about it, did you? No, no, definitely not. I mean, I, I think I'd maybe like had a look at uh, a few books and, you know, I'd obviously seen Star Wars, but I had no idea how any of that stuff was really made, of course. Would yeah. you say that you basically just made it up as you went along? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's something about film. I mean, I don't want to sound like one of those guys that goes, oh, film, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was kind of quite mysterious because you just never knew what was going to, what you were going to get out and you'd get it out like, you know, six weeks later. It, it was a real mystery as to what the effect might be. Oh, uh, really? So you, you were actually having to, to have the film developed. You couldn't just plug it into a TV and, and you're ready to go. No, we had no idea. Um, we had to send it off to Melbourne and wait six weeks and then get it back in the mail. Do you remember what that cost to, oh, to have your film developed? I think it was, was like it expensive? three hundred dollars or so. Wow! Like, yeah, that was Holy. like so. That was for three minutes of film, <laughs> four minutes of film, or something like under four minutes of film. Dang! I remember when I was a kid, I had a newspaper route, and I think I made thirty dollars a month. I would be like ten months worth of newspaper deliveries to <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, yeah. to pay for that that film. Yeah, uh, that's funny. I don't, it was funny. My teacher, I don't think, believed that we'd actually done it, and so you know. We kept saying, oh, it's in the mail, <laughs> it's in the mail. <laughs> right. So, yeah, it finally got delivered and, um, and we screened it. That's really a, a great thing to note here. You know, you, you had no idea really what you were doing, but you just did it. You just went ahead and you said, hey, I saw Star Wars. I, I know that it's possible to capture frames of animation and have it turn into something uh, that I can screen and uh, that people can enjoy. I'm just going to do it and figure it out along the way. I didn't know that the plasticine would melt. I didn't know what kind of lights to use. I did, you know, there's just so many unknowns, but you just 
uh, dove headfirst and figured it out along the way. And I see a lot of people being held back because they create all these barriers for themselves. Like, you know, like let's use a web comic as an example. Like, how big should I make my panels? And then they stop. Or it's like, uh, how thick should my lines be? Which font should I use for my characters? There's all these questions that, you know, it doesn't really matter. You could just do mm-hmm. anything. And you can just make it up along the way and then just say, hey, this is the prototype. I can always redo it if I wanted to. I think that's it. In a sense, it's probably easier to go either way these days, you know, to be precious about something or not be precious. Um, I, it, well, I read uh, uh, Ed Catmull's book, his latest book recently about, you know, Pixar called Cre- Creativity Inc. There's a really interesting point that he made, which I just think is gold. Andrew Stanton said it. That was like, you know, make mistakes, but make them really quickly. These days, y- you've got the opportunity to make mistakes so quickly and it's great you can get them out of the way you can just keep making lots and lots and lots of mistakes and finally you'll just start kicking goals just keep kicking definitely yeah i forget who who coined the terms like fail faster but holds true We're going to skip over a whole ton of stuff, but let's talk about what does a visual effects supervisor actually do on your website? I saw that we had worked on one similar project, which was uh, Superman Returns, and uh, we worked with, I believe it was the visual effects supervisor on a previous incarnation of the film. Um, But I was always curious what this guy does because he just Mm. seemed like a cool guy that hung out and he gave us pointers on the art, but... He just seemed like if we're on the same high school class, like he would be the cool kid, the Fonz, basically. I'm not sure if this is what your character is or, or how you, you're like on a shoot, but that's how this guy seemed like to me. And I, I just remember looking up to him and just thinking like, wow, I have no idea what he actually tangibly does because he just comes in here once in a while and talks to us a little bit. What does a visual effects supervisor do? And for you specifically, like how are you hands on or, or how does that look? It it. it does definitely vary across the industry um, in terms of, you know, going from television commercial to film uh, project. I'm really more involved in television commercials for, you know, the, the VFX supervision. I've worked with a number of film visual effects supervisors, as you've mentioned, but I mean, probably a closer colleague was um, on the on the knowing um, Andrew Jackson. So I was a com- compositor on the knowing at um, at Animal Logic. Uh, we'd sit with him in in dailies. You'd go through your your composites, and uh, basically he would be the one to keep the ball rolling. You know, he he would uh, make the suggestions in terms of where the the shot should be going for the director. So he's taking into account, of course, art direction, but mainly the technical standpoint of how something should look. It, yeah, what I think Andrew's role there is is really to take it across the whole arc of the production. So it starts way back in pre-production and all the planning uh, and, the, and the, the creative conversations that, that sort of go into it to achieve a particular effect or result and then seeing that through the, the shoot with the production and then into post-production with obviously what, what I, the, the role that I was involved in compositing through to colour grade and then final output with the director. For television commercials, the type of visual effects supervision that I do, it's like a condensed version of that. You know, you, you're on set, you've had the conversations, but <laughs> things often change. Yeah, definitely. I guess you're the voice of the director for the visual effects for the entirety of the project. I think that's how we could sum this up, that there might be different teams at different stages or different people kind of coming and going depending on their specialities, but you've got the creative vision and you're helping to make that come to light throughout the whole project. Yeah, I mean, often uh, on a a television commercial, you know, the director won't have that much experience of of visual effects. So you've got to, you know, educate him and the crew basically you know bring everyone together put them on the same page and just work with people i mean actually getting along with people is probably the 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 best bit and the hardest bit so you've got that cool guy thing you're getting along with people (laughs) and making everybody you know when they're all stressed out you're like calming them down and (laughs) (laughs) what did the fonts say you know yeah sit on it yeah (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. Uh, well hopefully (laughs) i have something more something none of your dry as dust professors and routine written doctors have Love, devotion, passion. 
So at the beginning of the episode, you mentioned that you work in a collective. I'm sure people have been doing it for a long, long time, but stumbling across these collectives um, in different industries, it's a bunch of people and they're all their own entities and they're in this sharing the same space. But could you explain how it works from your own perspective? I'm based here in Sydney with uh, a number of other creatives. So I've got about, I guess, 10 or 12. Everybody's kind of got their own business identity. We, we share a, um, a fairly large warehouse space. It is often used for photographic shoots, music clips, um, visual effects shoots. Like we've got a green screen, we've got, you know, um, a cyclorama. There's lights and, you know, there's ability to sort of, like, it's a double story space so that you know there's ability to hang lights and all this sort of stuff and it's also used for you know performances and events and and that sort of thing as well it has a lot of flexibility and then of course there's kind of the studio part like the post-production part where all the computers are safely tucked away (laughs) for uh, you know which for events is very important we team up on various projects and help each other out you know we might hire people here and there um, freelancers yeah and, and so there's there's a, a, a lot of flexibility there I suppose but everyone manages their own business yeah yeah I think that's so cool do you know the story of how the collective came together I mean we were talking a little bit before the episode and I think the old way of thinking would be you know I want to have my own little company so I'm going to get a couple people together to start and then we'll get like a salesperson and we'll start getting projects and we might get bigger but then there's all this stress and but I like this model because it sounds like there's a lot of flexibility in it and you can focus on what you truly enjoy doing. Um, you're your own island, but you've got a bunch of other islands with you and, and you help each other out. I actually, I actually went down that route once and I did find all the, the overheads of the tax side, this sort of stuff. I mean, there's an adage, you know, you've got to work on your business, not in your business. But I wanted to work in the business. You know, that was the motivation for forming a studio in the first, first place. This is great in the, you know, allows you to work with very low overheads, but, uh, you know, there's strength in numbers and you can take on, you can still take on bigger jobs. I think the extension of this, which is for me even more exciting, is the possibility to be able to work remotely, to see artists come together collectively, being based in places all around the world. How did the space start initially? Was it a couple of people having an idea or was it already existing and you just plugged into an existing uh, space? Uh, uh, CASA 3642 was, was started by a, a group of guys uh, and girls working together on photographic work. And they kind of collected a, a number of photographers and then illustrators came into the picture. And I've, I'm probably the latest to the party, to be honest. <laughs> but it's been really good. Yeah, I really love this model because, you know, I'm I'm often at home doing my thing by myself and it is really nice to be able to grab a lunch with somebody, um, bounce an idea off of someone, help someone out with a problem and you just don't have that opportunity when you're, you know, a freelancer or you're or you're working at home or or whatever your situation is and I think it's it's fantastic. So if, if there was somebody out there who wanted to start a space like this, what would you tell them to do or what makes this space work or what makes it really cool? Because there's so many freelancers out there that would actually benefit and it's probably not that difficult. You could start with a tiny, like the tiniest of tiny spaces with three desks. What are some of the, the cool parts or the things that you enjoy most for that they could take those away as, as something to think about if they were going to start their own space? Look, I think it's just about finding like-minded people. You have to be able to enjoy the company of the people you're going to work with and just have that community sense of respect for for everyone else. Um, uh, and all the logistics will kind of flow from there. Yeah, I don't think there's any hard and fast rule, but you definitely got to enjoy the company of the people you're working with. Key thing is finding like-minded people and then things will kind of take care of themselves. Yeah, yeah, I think so. All right. So you you had mentioned that you were doing some teaching. And since, you know, we, we focus on art education, I thought that might be a cool thing to talk about as well. I taught at the Australian Film Television School for sort of since 2001. Uh, I looked after the 3D department for a couple of years as well. Recently, I've been teaching with uh, the International Screen Academy, uh, which is a Sydney-based uh, film school. Uh, they are both acting and film making based so 
there's a good mix of actors and filmmakers. Um, one of the things that's come up a lot uh, for us recently is people wanting to um, get a career and then kind of running up against a brick wall. Or what have you seen students do that separates them and, and makes their journey into the workforce easier? Because you've seen you know, a, a wide range of different students and some people that you think might do well might actually not do well, or some people that you think might do poorly, they might uh, land an amazing job. Well, I mean, obviously, a lot of luck is involved, um, but Ooh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I, I do think that having an understanding of yourself and what it is that drives your own creativity is really important. Uh, you know, it's such an intangible. I think the most important thing is really understanding yourself as much as you can. Just to go one level deeper, did you have at some point like an aha moment for yourself where you're like, oh? Now I understand myself, or is it a <laughs> continual evolution? Yeah, no. I'm sure there was breakthroughs <laughs> along the way, but to let's say somebody's stuck right now and they're like, okay, sure, great. The visual effects supervisor says, just discover your creative self. <laughs> Aha, it's so easy. You know, like it's <laughs> in that mindset, it's not so easy, but no, maybe there's some no. clues along the path or some things that you've experienced. I spent a lot of time getting to know the software because I guess computers were a bit like a game when, you know, I first started using them. They're a bit, they're a bit novel. You know, the, the software itself was fascinating. I kind of regret that approach now. I think I wasted a lot of time. The, the, the most Im interesting and important part was the, the people that I met during courses and uh, in collaboration with on various projects. So, I think collaborate as much as you can uh, would probably be the most important thing if I was to look back. That is a fantastic tip and something that I had never really considered before. And I don't think we've um, brought it up on the podcast. Uh, this is something that I did when I was uh, in high school. I was bored. I, I lived in a little village, and but we had the internet. Like The internet was quite new at that time. I think it was around 96 or at least it was new for where I was at. And I found these chat rooms where there was artists talking and I would go in there and then I would organize. And it was crazy what I tried to organize. I would say like, let's do a four minute animation this weekend. Mm. And I'd get people really excited about it. Of course, we managed to produce some models and that was about it because it just takes way longer. But when you're young and naive, uh, you don't know. But the cool thing was that all these people were learning at the same time. So you're sharing knowledge and you were, um, if somebody found, some, figured out something that they, they could tell you about it and just shortcut your learning. And then maybe a door opens for them and then they can open that same door for you in six months time, or they can introduce you to somebody that they met. So I think this is a fantastic, amazing tip. I can't believe I've never written about this, talked about this. Um, thank you so much for bringing this up, Matt. <laughs> I'm, I'm Thoroughly flattered. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> uh, you can apply this to absolutely anything. Find like-minded people, you know. On Facebook, there's probably a group for it where people are talking about it right now. It goes one step deeper when you actually collaborate and you work on a project together and say like, hey, you're responsible for this, I'm responsible for this. Let's just try and make something and see what happens and, and make it fun. It should be easier these days, but it's both easier and harder, I think, in many ways because you can kind of just get lost in uh, appreciation of all that's out there. Like, you know, they're, they can just be overwhelming. And so you can kind of just lose sight of the, the simple challenges when you come together to uh, so solve something creatively or the, the simple act of showing your own work. It reveals a lot about yourself. Yeah, right? definitely. Uh, another thing that, that just popped into my head here, I've received a lot of email from people asking about how do I get into video games? Like there's no studio nearby me. I can't afford to go to college to learn this you know there's all these self-imposed limitations but i'm willing to bet that there's a very hungry community that would love to embrace you and have you join their project um and this is again one of the things that i did um when i first went overseas i found a a, a little team that was making modifications for video games so they took a co popular computer game and then we made new vehicles for it and new characters and new art and new programming uh you know new things that the, the players could do and these opportunities are all over the place and you just have to start looking for them so if you want to be in 
video games. You could be in video games tomorrow. There's all kinds of things where you can help out on. And then when you go to, you know, air quotes here, get a real job in the real industry, whatever that is, visual effects, games, whatever. If you've already worked on projects, you know a lot of the the problems that are going to come up. And so you're maybe even a little bit ahead of uh, somebody that goes through a, a school program that doesn't offer this sort of like a collaborative design and creation process schools are fantastic but um there, there's a there's a tendency to focus on grading and that sort of thing which they have to answer to various governments <laughs> you know mm-hmm. appro- approve learning processes that sort of thing you know i was fortunate i guess with the film school the australian film television school where i did my, my masters they were focused on a major project which it was you know is much better than uh, having to uh, submit, you know, a, a string of works. If you, you submit a major work, uh, you're forced to you know, collaborate and do all those things that you should do for a film or whatever. It's easy in the school system, I think, to lose sight of the bigger picture. Most schools are actually a fantastic opportunity, but it's the relationships that you make there at those schools, um, those creative relationships that are probably going to be more important than the actual work you do there. All right. Well, I think that's the perfect place to wrap this up. Um, Matt, where can people find you online? If you're up for it, like how can people get in touch if they ever had questions for you? Oh, absolutely. Look, um, my site is uh, www.mattmccosker.com. So it's M-A-T-M-C-C-O-S-K-E-R.com. And I think there's, you know, get get in touch with the site is probably easiest. uh, And yeah, look forward to hearing from people. Awesome. And we'll have show notes um, for this as well, as usual, at pencilkings.com slash... I can't talk today. (laughs) Slash Matt McCosker. M-A-T dash M-C-C-O-S-K-E-R. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back. Um, Matt, this this was a great episode. See if you can find yourself a collaboration before we release the next episode that's my challenge to you what does the fun say hey stay, <laughs> st- stay frosty this is a pence kings podcast we'll see you next week <laughs>